So good morning and uh, welcome to the second of a series of what we hope um, is a topical BCIS hosted webinar. Um, my name is David Crossway and I lead the BCIS consultancy service and uh, I'm acting as host for this event today. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a, a construction economist uh, with over 20 years experience in the sector. Um, with a background uh, that started at Davis Langdon and subsequently went on to ACOM. Um, and I've been at RACS now for, for about five years. Um, so a quick bit of housekeeping before we start, um, just to let you know we're recording the webinar um, and we'll make the recording available on the event landing page, along with the presentations and uh, a transcript of the Q and A session. Hopefully, we'll get some some Q and A during during the during the webinar. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's also worth reminding you that we'll probably be emailing you directly as well with uh, with any of the outputs from from today's session. Um, so, without further ado, let's get let's get going. Our our, our focus today is inflation um, and how to mitigate any inflationary risk on a project. Um, and it's probably worthwhile setting um, the scene. Uh, actually, when we when we set this webinar up uh, a few months ago, the inflationary pressures in the sector were just starting to to get brewing, and obviously that's really come to, come to the fore over the last uh, last month or so. Um, I mean, currently in the UK, we've 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 got a, a situation where we've got increased demand um, combined with serious supply problems, um, which have related to Brexit and COVID nineteen, um, and both combined have, have created a perfect environment for inflation in the sector. Um, adding to that a rise in shipping costs um, and delays at the ports, and you end up with uh, significant inflationary pressures, which we're currently experiencing. Um, and according to our latest industry panel, these pressures are likely to be here for some time to come. There, there doesn't appear to be a um, a window of easing of, of, of these pressures. So um, it's, uh, it, it, we're building up a sort of perfect pressure cooker uh, effect in our, in our industry. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure some of you're aware, um, recent media coverage has highlighted price rises and a lack of supplies of uh, particular building materials. Um, and the Office for National Statistics has projected a, a rise of uh, between seven and eight percent in material prices this year. Um, with increases for certain materials such as timber um, likely to be more than double that. And when we've also highlighted um, uh, steel sections, rebar, copper, insulation, cement um, and, and metal cladding all experiencing sharp increases in prices at the moment. Um, so given that scene and that scenario, uh, I'm, I'm often surprised um, by the lack of attention, the potential risk of inflation on project outturn receives. Um, even today, um, some clients adopt the practice of applying single whole economy indices, such as the, the retail price index, to cover the inflation risk in a contract. Um, however, construction projects will not inflate at the same level as the domestic consumer was measured in the RPI. Um, and therefore contractors are likely to inflate their rates to cover the risk, meaning that the tendered rates could be higher. Um, and the use of non-construction indices creates a double risk to the contractor. Uh, the introduction of these risks will result either in a risk premium being built into the initial price, or, or possibly both, both of these instances, pressures on the contractor due to insufficient provision in the contract for inflation. The perception by clients is, is this practice does not subject them to, to any risk. However, the reality is that the inflationary risk is undoubtedly being included by the supply chain in their base rates. Um, and although if not adequately covered, um, then the contractor could be at risk of negative cash flow problems or worse. So in the presentations that follow, um, Aaron Wright from, from, from BCIS will outline methods to, to mitigate the inflation risk on projects. Um, and then it'll be followed by Nikki Evans from Skanska, who will provide some practical examples um, of real life approaches. So 
after the presentations, we'll have some time for questions. Um, you can ask questions by typing in the question box, which you can locate in the questions section on your control panel. Unfortunately, given the numbers on the call, we will not be able to, to unmute attendees and have you asking them in person. So if you can type them into, into, into the question box um, and we'll, we'll address them at, at the end of the session in about half an hour. Um, so we'll now make a start on the presentations. Um, so first up is Aaron. So over to you, Aaron. Thanks, David. So my name is Aaron Wright. I'm part of the team responsible for the Building Cost Information Service, the BCIS. And more specifically, I work on the consultancy side, like David, of the business, where we offer a variety of bespoke solutions to our clients. For over 60 years, BCIS has provided the construction industry with information on estimating construction costs and publishes numerous indices, amongst other useful things. And today, over the next 15 minutes, I'm mainly going to focus on these indices and forecasts and explain how these can be used to help you mitigate the risk of inflation. I've got eight slides for you today, and I'm going to start things off by talking about inflation, and it's important whilst sharing our latest forecast with you. I'll summarise the three main types of index, which are cost index, tender price index, and output price index, and where they are best applied. Then I'll outline BCIS's six rules for helping select the most suitable index. We'll then look at RPI v PAFI and discuss the benefit of using PAFI to mitigate inflationary risk. I'll provide some examples of, of PAFI and illustrate how they have differed over the past 10 years. I'll then present some BCIS sector specific cost indices, including rail, road, and water. And then I'll provide some predictions on the future. And lastly, I'll outline what BCIS offers to assist clients and contractors on reducing inflationary risk. Right, so is inflation actually a risk? I mean, what does the future look like? Well, these are the latest BCIS forecasts that are published on BCIS online today. On average, tender prices are anticipated to increase around 4% per annum over the next five years. This is off the back of a fall in 2020, where they went down 2.1%, and largely as a consequence of the economic uncertainty around Brexit and the impact of COVID-19. With construction output declining by 16.3% in 2020, we anticipate it recovering by 9.1% in 2021, largely down to the low base caused by the COVID-19 recession, coupled with the government's ambitious plans of investing over 600 billion over the next five years. The main take home from all of this, and without getting lost in the numbers, is inflation has an important part to play over the next five years and beyond. And it's important the most appropriate index is selected. If we are not forecasting correctly, the danger is we are allocating large sums relating to budgets that either aren't enough, with that shortfall needed to be found, or are too much, and that money could be used elsewhere. If we assume 600 billion is spent equally over the next five years, that equates to 120 billion a year. A 1% difference in inflation would equate to more than 1 billion, and that's just for year one and doesn't take into account the uh, effect of compounding. That's a massive amount of money and inappropriate provision for inflation is costly and a major risk. So there are three main types of index which you might want to consider. A cost index, which provides a measure of the movement in the cost of labor, plant and material to a contractor. More specifically, they tend to be used when preparing estimates and budgets and in inflationary clauses in contracts, which is the area today's webinar focuses on. The other two types are a tender price index. This provides the movement in prices agreed between clients and contractors at the commit to construct stage. This is usually when the tender is accepted and is usually used for adjusting estimates and budgets to different dates. And lastly, an output price index provides a measure of the average price of construction projects currently on sites. And by this, I mean the movement in prices paid by clients when the work is actually undertaken normally reflecting accepted tenders in previous periods. Generally speaking, these are used to convert construction output volume figures from current to constant prices and used for major construction and infrastructure program. So we've recently produced a white paper on mitigating inflation risks on projects, which you can access via the shortened URL at the bottom of this slide. 
In this paper, we provide our six rules for choosing an appropriate index, which was follows. So number one, always be clear about what you want to measure and how you apply it. Two, choose an index that measures the costs that most closely match what you actually want to measure. Three, when using an index linking something in a contract or agreement, be clear that it meets your needs, paying close attention to the frequency of its publication and the updating and revisions policy. Number four is understand the inputs to the index and the methodology for its calculation. Number five, make sure you read the notes and definitions and importantly, understand them. And the last one, number six, never, never, never choose an index because of its past performance. So PAFI, price adjustment for indices, have been around a very, very long time. This formerly method of calculating fluctuations was actually introduced nearly 40 years ago, back in 1973. In the past, they have been referred to by other names like NIDO, which stands for National Economic Development Organization, who originally produced them. They've been referred to as Baxter and Osborne, which are the surnames of the chairpersons response, uh, res respectively for the civil engineering and building indices elements of this. PAFI are methods for calculating the increase or decrease in contractors' cost over any given period and are published on BCIS online. They tend to be more widely used in larger building and civil engineering contracts. They've been designed to allow a client or a funder to take on or even share the risk of inflation over the contract period. That's where the contract sum, target cost, capital funding allowance, etc., are linked to and adjusted by an index. PAFI provides a change in factory gate prices and nationally agreed wage awards and are applied in the United Kingdom. So RPI is one of the most common measures of inflation and is often used to reimburse costs in construction contracts. Although the procedure is relatively simple and transparent, with RPI being more widely known and accessible, where a single calculation is undertaken for inflation, it is fundamentally flawed and will not provide a representative coverage of inflation. What would you rather have your construction projects cost reimbursed against? A basket which includes crisps, biscuits, and pet food, or bricks, timber, and cement? RPI is based on consumer purchases, not construction materials and labor, like PAFI. Independent indices like PAFI aligned to your project work activities instead of RPI will reduce inflationary risk. In the context of construction, the PAFI basket is relevant, the RPI basket is not, and it's going to expose you to additional risk. Inflation is that there are a number of different indices that you can choose from. There's actually more than 500 which are relevant to construction. And from my experience of working in a cost research unit, I know, I know some QSs still don't understand the difference between a cost index, a tender price index, and an output price index, let alone the 500 indices you can choose from. This slide illustrates how some PAFI have performed since 2010 and shows how much they can vary. You can see that RPI is relatively stable, increasing by 38.2% over the period in the middle there, whereas PAFI are considerably more volatile. For example, gas oil fuel climbs by 51.4% in the first two years and then falls progressively over the next four, resulting in a decrease of 31.8% overall. Today, the cost of gas oil fuel is only 6.4% higher than what it was in 2010, but we know this doesn't paint the whole picture. We can also see how steel for reinforcement and steel section have fared. In the first eight years, they've generally followed a similar pattern, but since steel sections has outstripped steel reinforcement, with it escalating dramatically in the last 12 months. If you were a contractor, would you be happy being reimbursed by RPI for steel section over the past 12 months? Did you include adequate provision in your tender to cover for this? Conversely, if you're a client, do you want to share risk rather than have to pay for it? As it's likely your contractor will include a healthy provision for this. Some costs might go down, and if you have passed the risk to the contractor, you'll in theory be paying twice. Once for the provision they have allowed for inflation, and twice on the contract terms of cost reimbursement. BCIS has over 20,000 projects in its database, and it's therefore well placed to produce representative baskets of goods for different types of projects and sectors. We publish a number of sector specific cost indices as shown on this slide, again going back over 10 years. 
Although variability is less between these than what we previously saw for PAFI, that's largely because there are a combination of the various PAFI which we produce. And there are many, many more where, which were provided on the previous slide. Having said this, there is still considerable variation. And after about two years in April 2012, there's nearly a 10 percentage point difference between road and rail. Although these indices are representative of typical projects in their sectors, they aren't going to precisely match yours as each project is unique. Having said that, they are going to be considerably more representative than RPI. It's always amusing to look back on futuristic predictions. By 2015, Arthur One wasn't riding around town on a hoverboard as was imagined in 1989 in, in Back to the Future. How can we predict the future? Um, we can hazard a guess on the government's interventions, which I suspect will help influence the direction of traffic in this space. Achieving net zero by 2050 is, is going to require some effort, and this is not going to happen overnight. You know, we've pledged to cut emissions, I think, by 78% by 2035. It's a, it's a safe bet to say gas boilers will be obsolete in the next few years and new solutions will emerge in their place. These solutions themselves could be obsolete in only a few years as technology evolves. In March this year, the government launched proposals to cut the subsidy on red diesel. And should this get the green light, the price will go from 11p to 58p per litre overnight in April 2022. That's a more than fivefold increase, so it just shows the, the nature of the beast here. Staffing developments and proposals keeps us informed about potential changes which may lay ahead which we can incorporate in, in potential forecasts. Being independent allows us to act impartially, bridging the gap between contractors and clients. The forecasts we produce are highly flexible. We can produce project-specific forecasts tailored to any individual project or for a complete business portfolio. For example, a large tier one contractor engaged us to calculate inflation forecasts for all their business which is comprised of a number of operating units with different sectors. So each operating unit had its own specific index and forecast, which rolled up into an overarching index for their business. As I've already said, we're, we're experienced in analysing construction costs and compiling all types of construction indices and are therefore experts for advising on choosing the right index and or auditing the work done by others in this area. It's important to note a lot of the forecasts available publicly are largely commodity driven. So the trade price of steel and raw metals, as opposed to what the industry is paying for, that is after it's gone through the supply chain. So a very raw commodity goes through processing, some form of component manufacture. We'll often have a stockpile of that commodity. So please be aware if you are using any forecasts that are available, make sure you understand what they're being forecast. We also align our forecast to specific locations. We previously supported a client who was considering a build in Cambridge at a time when it was a real construction hotspot. So you need to consider the regional context of projects when forecasting inflation. We can also create scenarios for our forecasts in the past. For instance, we've um, considered external influences like Brexit and more recently the COVID-19 pandemic. We can consider anything we or a client identifies as a potential pinch point. If anyone has any questions or comments on anything covered today, please reach out to us by email or on LinkedIn and I'll do my best to help. We're always exploring new ways to evolve our offer and meet clients' requirements, so please get in touch if anything is of interest or you think we might be able to help you. Thanks for, for listening and I'll now pass you on to, to Nikki from Skanska. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Nikki Evans. I worked in the construction industry for the past 26 years on numerous projects of numerous complexity, um, but for the contractor side. And I'm currently head of commercial services for Skanska UK. I was asked to look at some practical case studies to share that knowledge with you from the contractor's perspective in how we mitigate that risk of inflation. So. There's numerous ways we do this, and it's essential that we consider the impact inflation may have from the earliest stage possible in order to protect our business. For an employer, it is important that they have as much cost certainty as possible to ensure the funding is there. 
and affordability. So when looking at tenders, contractors need to look at the risk of inflation, taking into account many things. For example, they may be tendering in 2021 for works that are going to commence in 2025. The length of the projects vary, also the complexity themselves with the location as well also having an impact. Here we would need to look at the tender price index, as Mar Aaron mentioned previously. The government may bring in changes of law, which also have an impact, policies and guidance, and they have that knock on effect on inflation. So it is vital we keep abreast of what is coming up. Brexit and climate change targets being both prime examples. If procurement is rushed, the details may be insufficient and the contractor will need to assess to protect themselves, potentially over inflating the tender price at risk. However, they could also have an insufficient price. One way to avoid this, which is fair for all parties, is for employers to split the works into smaller packages, such as they did on Crossrail and HS2. On HS2, for example, they let an enabling package prior to the main works itself, dealing with the demolition and the utilities and remediation in a five year block, and then went on to the main works, while still finalising those details of the design and build. During contract negotiations, a contractor needs to consider three options mainly. Firstly, if there is a clause or a mechanism in that contract which deals with inflation. Secondly, a clause where adjustment is based on the difference in cost between base prices and the current price of local labour and specified materials. And thirdly, where adjustment is made by the use of an indices in a formula. In short period contracts, the normal is for there to be no clause for adjustment to be made to the contract sum for price escalation in respect for such things as labour and materials. And the contractor therefore carries that risk and financial burden. The contractor needs to assess the expected cost and price accordingly. This, however, for contracts exceeding, say, two years, is very difficult to predict. Nobody knew COVID-19 was going to happen, for example. So a contractual mechanism mechanism is the most prudent option to ensure that the employer does not see the cost increase due to the added risk put upon by the contractor. If the tender documentation does not include for inflation, it's also good for us to negotiate that in. It is important to note that the indices within a contract need to be appropriate, as Aaron mentioned, but also that they are sufficient to recover the costs. As Aaron mentioned, the contractor will avoid the use of RPI, they don't want that basket of groceries. This creates a double risk for the contractor, the risk for retail price inflation and the risk resulting from the inflation in their own costs themselves. The introduction of these will lead to either a risk premium being built in into the initial price or to pressures on the contractor as a result of insufficient provisions for the inflation. In the P PFI world, it is common to see RPI used but there generally is a multiplication factor added to try to ensure that inaccuracy is minimised. So the, the, the choice of indices is vital. As David mentioned, we're currently in an industry seeing a hike in material prices due to a combination of factors such as Brexit, COVID-19 and also the knock-on effect of the blockage of the Suez Canal. We are seeing price increases for materials this year from anything so far between 2% to 25% for a wide range of construction materials from timber to concrete to steel, anything and everything really. There are shortages in materials currently throughout the industry, but in fact the actual world. British Steel has advised that they are temporarily closing their order books a couple of weeks ago. How as a contractor do we predict that at tender stage? which may have been four years ago in large infrastructure projects, which can take 20 years to complete. Suppliers are also seeing increases. Hanson, for example, this month advised a significant increase in the price for ready mix mixed concrete due to the carbon based increases from their suppliers. This being a knock on effect from a government policy. When mitigating the risk of inflation, you cannot look at just one factor, rather a combination of numerous. For the contractors, an inflation strategy is usually put in place at tender stage alongside a detailed procurement strategy. It could be that there is no inflation clause and they purchase and store materials, for example, steel at the beginning of the contract. They may not need it now, but in four years, but with the price indicating that they are likely to increase, then it could be more cost effective to purchase now and store securely. There is a balanced judgment needed. 
So if you can see, there are many considerations that the contractor needs to take into account when looking at large, complex, lengthy infrastructure projects. But the timing of the tender, the time between the tender, the award and the delivery, the relevant indexes are vital and the government and policy and procedures that are going on. Global economic stability is another one. Employer insolvency, uh, skill shortage, material prices and plant rates. So I wanted to share with you an example of one of our contracts. We're currently working on HS2 mainworks in central London around the Euston area. This is based on an NEC3 option C and incorporates a secondary clause known as option X1. On the screen, you will see the clause that has been included. Option C being a target cost form of contract and X1 is included when there is to be a price adjustment for inflation. With this option, the risk of inflation is initially borne by the employer as he pays the recorded defined cost, which effectively are those current costs each month plus a fee. The risk of that is then subsequently shared with the contractor through the application and calculation of the contractor's share. It is the target cost which requires adjustment for inflation on this project as the defined cost itself is paid. The source of the published priced indices to be used should be identified in part of the contract data together with the proportions for the total value of works to be linked to the index for each category. Allowance is made for non-adjustable portion, which represents the proportion for which the contractor carries the risk of inflation. The total of the proportion should be one. Also entered into the contract data is the base date. In this case, it was the 31st of December 2019. Normally that would be four to six weeks before the latest date for submitting tenders, but we were involved on this project in an ECI phase where we worked on producing and agreeing the target cost stage prior to construction, which is why that base date looks different. From both the employers and the contractors perspective, the key is to ensure that this target is accurate as possible with the details known at the point of tender. Adjustment for inflation is necessary for the calculation of the total of prices, which is only used to calculate that contractor's share and not the periodic payments, so it doesn't really affect cash flow. This arises because the price of work do done to date is the defined cost plus that fee, and defined cost is the current cost and automatically includes any inflation occurring since that base date. However, since the contractor's share is calculated with the difference between the total of price of work done to date, the two most compatible in terms of allowance for inflation, the total of prices is derived from an activity schedule and it is, it is with which must be adjusted for inflation as you go. So apologies for, it's a little bit complicated on the screen, um, but as you'll see on the slide, um, I've put an example of how this formula works. This is actually for one of the subcontracts that are on HS2. It also shows the mix of indices that are used to calculate that single index based on predetermined weightings. For example, you see that there is one there for labour, one for plant, one for concrete and one for steel, all with a different weighting and proportion. This leaves limited opportunity with all data and calculations being clearly defined in the contract data and agreed between the parties as part of the contract negotiation process, this leaves limited opportunity for the inflationary measures or price adjustments in this case to be open to interpretation. And it does what the NEC wants and promotes a collaborative commercial arrangement between the project manager and the contractor. As you'll see, HS2 is using the price adjustment formula index published by the BCIS which is known and used and trusted. On a quarterly basis, we download these indices from the BCIS service and apply the calculation, and this provides the inflationary price adjustment formula. One consideration is that of assessing compensation events for the target increase. These need to be assessed at the base date, so you could be actually assessing a compensation event in 2021, but you'd have to take it back to 2019, which is the base date in this example. And this means that any aspect of the agreed quotation making up the event that is not already priced at the contract base date must be deflated back um, as set out in that date. If compensation events are not implemented at base date values, there's a potential for the contractor to receive an assessment of inflation twice, once with the compensation event and again with the periodic price adjustment is applied. 
So with these long term contracts, one of the ways that um, the employers want to deal with this is by doing something known as a framework and sometimes a term contract. All of which deal with inflation in very similar ways from what we found. We use these with Highways England, Network Rail and Cadent, which is gas network. When we tendered these projects, we actually submitted rates at that point in time and they are though then subject to inflation. Cadent, for example, we didn't submit rates for materials, but we did for labour and supervision. And then they would be. By using a framework, this then minimises that exposure for both parties for inflation. You let smaller packages within that framework. So Highways England could have 50 packages um, over that six year period rather than one large, huge one. Uh, smaller packages are let for shorter periods and the contractor would tender on a project by project basis using the rates within the framework and inflationary uplift on those. This minimises the risk of overpricing for the employer, but then mitigates the risk of prices, which are difficult to predict when it is such a long contract. It's important when looking at inflation for both parties. An insolvent contractor is of no use to an employer whatsoever. The employer doesn't also want to pay over the odds. So as Aaron said, there is a significant effort put into attempting to predict the future. We'll never get it 100% right, but we can certainly try. Um, it isn't always impossible, unfortunately. So I just thank you and look forward to some questions later. Thank you, Nikki. Um, we're happy to take some questions now.